All right. So did you guys read the chapters, 27 to 28? Yeah, good. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all for joining me here in beautiful Punta Cana, Dominican Republic. Oh, wait, no, that's... Uh, uh, Brian is in Punta Cana. <laughs> we're not there. Um, for those of you watching, we, uh, we're not at the building today. We actually decided to, to do this from one of our home fellowships. So we're at Mike's place in Mogador, not in Punta Cana. Um, and we'll see how this goes. I haven't done this before. Um, we'll see if the streaming does well. I think it will. But, uh, but that's where we are if this looks a little different to you. All right, so we're in Acts 27, 1 through 28, 15. And a summary of last teaching was, uh, or at least the, the big takeaway from it, is that we, we, we do ourselves a favor by rethinking Paul, uh, how we interpret and understand Paul, what he was, what he was teaching, what he was all about, uh, since that seems to be what um, uh, most of our uh, Christian faith uh, has and, and practice is based on is a, is, a, is a particular understanding and interpretation of Paul. And so by rethinking Paul, we can have a, we can come to scripture with a, with more open eyes, I think, clearer understanding and, and the ability to, um, to, to interface with it honestly, um, and with humility and, um, uh, not thinking that we know what's going on, right? So, so that's that, that's basically the big takeaway. This week will be. Oh wait. Oh hold on. This week will be. Oh, I I gotta connect to the, to the internet here. Um, while I do that, uh, so this week it. There's going to be a. I've had a difficult time trying to find what the big lesson is because this is a um, travel log, right? It's a, here's what happened. Here's a couple interesting interesting episodes on his way to Rome. Okay, and so there's there's probably a lot of different ways uh, we could take this. Let me sign in here. And I remembered your password. Oh, you're sharing. Oh, okay. Oh, you okay? Great. Cool. Well, I panicked because I I saw on my notes like nothing was there because I hadn't synced yet. Okay, cool. All right, I'm good. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> bear with me. Um, there we go. Okay. Uh, all right. So I want to start off with talking about the letter to the Romans uh, and ask a question that we'll be able to answer at the end of this, this particular portion of, of Acts. Paul had written Romans three years earlier, and he had never been to Rome yet. He hadn't been in, in, to visit the Roman uh, um community there. He knew some people there. He knew Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, we see in the end of Rome's a bunch of people he said he's wanting to say hello to, but he hadn't yet at that time when he wrote Romans, he hadn't yet visited. Uh, so he didn't know, uh, or, or he, he wasn't addressing in his letter to the Romans specific problems that a lot of his other epistles seem to have been addressing, right? He's a lot of the epistles are like, yeah, I, I, you know, I've been talking with with so and so, and 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 they tell me such and such. Here's here's how you you deal with this. Rome, he hadn't been to yet. He knew of some of the folks, uh, but didn't have as intimate an understanding of the community there to be able to, to address things specifically. It's the only, um, yeah, it's the only letter, and this is the only letter he had written to a people he hadn't yet visited that we have in our Greek scriptures. What this letter did was lay the groundwork for influencing the community there to be a kind of hub for his continued ministry farther afield. And in Romans, he specifically mentions Spain. He wants Rome to be a place where he can go, leave from to go to Spain and continue his ministry. So he was looking forward to this. Um, and Romans is, of, of all his 
epistles, it is the most um, exhaustive, the most articulate, the, 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 the best reasoned and well thought out of all of his letters and epistles. And so it was very, a very a, a profound uh, letter that he was sending. What he didn't know was how it would be received. Didn't know how it was going to be received. And he didn't know, he couldn't have known how he was going to be received after having sent this letter. Something else to keep in mind, too, about what's, what had been happening in Rome. When we meet Priscilla and Aquila, it's because they had left Rome. Why? Why had they left Rome? you remember? Did they want to leave Rome? <laughs> they were expelled. Remember, there was an expulsion of the Jewish people from Rome. Emperor Claudius said, you got to go, right? So they left, and there was a lot of other people who left. For only about five years were they outside of Rome. After, at the end of about five years, they all went back. So think about this. There is a community of uh, Jewish and non-Jewish believers who are in a Jewish context in Rome. They're, they're in community together. They're doing their thing. And the, Ro the, the Jewish people have to go. And so they, there is a, a synagogue, a community of people of no more Jews. So you are a Gentile uh, uh, God-fearer, believer in Yeshua, and you don't have your Jewish brothers and sisters to help you along with this understanding, to, to, to learn from, to keep the traditions going, and you have no idea if they're ever going to come back. There's no reason to think that they would, uh, so it's like, okay, this is a new reality. What could happen in those five years? What do you think? Do things change? Could. could, yeah. Could 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 change dramatically, drastically, right? So when the the Jewish people then came back, they were coming. They were probably coming back. They hoped to just same old, same old, right? They're coming back home. Oh, thank goodness! They get there, they open the door, and they go, "What's that? <laughs> like what? What's? Huh? What's going on? Can you?" at least imagine what kind of conflict, unanticipated conflict there was when they came back. If there was any, if there was any kind of um, division between the Gentile and Jewish believers before the Jews left with no uh, return date in sight, there was probably a little bit more so when they came back. And they may have been dealing with this. Paul did know about this. He did know that they were gone for a while, and they went back, and that must have caused some strain. Um, to what degree? Probably he didn't know. But we do know that in Acts 15, he does address a particular subject. So I want to go there, Acts 15, the first 13 verses. Uh, and I'm reading from the NASB. <clears throat> And this is toward the end. There's 16 chapters. This is toward the end. He's, he's been making his case, you know, his, his very articulate, well-reasoned case for the gospel. It's, it's a, a very, it's, a, it's, a, it's, almost, it's an almost perfect book. Well, it's a perfect book. We'll just say that. And this is toward the end. So he says, verse 15, chapter 15, verse 1, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. So as I keep reading through this, think of how he may be addressing this kind of Romans. I'm sorry, Romans. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> Romans 15. As I read this, think, keep that in mind. He's writing to a group of people who have this strain that, that they now have to deal with. They didn't anticipate. It wasn't their fault. I mean, you know, if the Jews left and the Gentiles were there, maybe they did the best they could and struggled through um, and had to make some decisions because their Jewish counterpart and, and leadership was gone. So, so keep that in mind. Verse 1 again. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. For even Messiah did not please himself. But as it is written, 
The reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now many, now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another, according to Messiah Yeshua, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord, Yeshua Messiah. Therefore accept one another, just as Messiah also accepted us to the glory of God. For I say that Messiah has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. Therefore, I will give praise to you among the Gentiles and I will sing to your name. Again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the people praise him. And, and again, Isaiah says, there shall come the root of Jesse and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. All throughout his ministry so far, he's dealing with this whole Gentile uh, grafting in that, that he's not dealing with. He's dealing with the reaction to it. He knows that in Rome, this has happened. They're this coming back together. The Jews have returned and maybe tried to you know, establish the way things were, but coming against some friction, likely. And he's sending this ahead of himself. He's sending it and has no idea how it's going to be received. He's hoping it's, it's going to be good. So we, you know, he has no idea. Is this going to be a good outcome or not? And they've, they've had this letter for about three years. Three years they've had this information. Okay, so... Question is, again, how did they receive the letter and how would he be received upon his arrival? Okay. All right. Back to Acts. <clears throat> Acts 27.1. And when it was decided that he should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. The other prisoners were most likely other uh, unresolved cases that of Felix's that Festus was wanted to just clear out. He's, he's like, just get move these along. I'm going to send all of these with you. This is a time of year, as we'll see, that is getting more and more dangerous to make passage from uh, from where they were in, in uh, on the east coast of the Mediterranean all the way to Rome and Italy. Um. And they left in the fall, presumably just before Rosh Hashanah. Uh, and in the year 59 AD, which is when this was, that would have been on September 24th. Okay. So November, December, it was like bad time of year, dangerous time of year to be, to be on, on, on the seas. They're leaving just before September 24th. Okay. So. Verse 2, and embarking in a ship of Adramidium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. Uh, some other sources say that there was also a gentleman by the name of Secundus from Thessalonica. Uh, so there was Aristarchus, likely Secundus. Luke, we know, was with him. Um, and these were not prisoners. These were traveling companions. And Paul. Verse 3. The next day we set, or we put in at Sidon. And Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and to be cared for. So Paul and company could stay with friends, but under guard. He hadn't been sentenced yet. Again, this was he was in kind of a, 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 a unusual state where there was charges that, that could have been dropped, but he appealed to Caesar. So it's like, okay, you got to go. There's this, this legal mechanism that's in place that can't be stopped. So how is he treated? They, he's a Roman citizen, so they can't treat him like dirt. Uh, but 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 he is still waiting to, to have a final uh, sentence handed down. So it's mostly like a mobile house arrest, right? It's like just like like just we know we know you're not going to run, you know. But just send you know so and so with you just to keep you. you know, so just just don't don't get me killed. Is <laughs> basically what the centurion was wanting. Just just behave and it will be fine. Verse four and putting out to sea. 
from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were, were against us. When we, lay, when, we, when we sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. This So up until this point, they're in smaller boats kind of along the coast going from one town to another. Finally, they get to uh, a place where there is a, a ship of Alexandria. This is a huge ship. It's a grain ship. From Alexandria to Rome was the route that the grain supply took, uh, and they did it often. And these were very large boats. Later on in the passage, we'll see that there was 276 people on the boat, including crew, um, prisoners, passengers. And, and this wasn't a passenger ship. So if there was 276 people who were able to go on this, you can imagine the size of the ship and how much grain there would have been in it as well, because this plays a factor too. Depending on the season, the direction you would travel from Alexandria to Rome or the return trip, based on when, uh, when the direction you were going, the winds, um, uh, the voyage could take anywhere from 10 days, if you're going from Rome to Alexandria, or two months which was Alexandria to Rome, based on, so, so it was a wide range of, of possible time lengths for this trip. Verse 7, we sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Sinus, uh, Sidus, and as the wind did not allow us to go further, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salmone. So they were already experiencing rough seas, and they hadn't really even gotten to the open sea yet. So it's already uh, not starting off well. Verse 8. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lesia. This is the last stop before attempting to cross the sea. Like, okay, we're going to go here. This is where we're going to make the decision if we're going to wait it out here or try to go across. Okay. Verse 9. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, and I'll just pause there. What is the fast? Day of Atonement. That's right, Yom Kippur. Um, Luke clearly presumes that his audience knows what is, what, what is meant by the fast, because that's obviously not the name of the day. It's, it is Yom Kippur, is the Day of Atonement. Uh, so that, that gives you an understanding of, of, of the who the audience was, um, and that it was important to, uh, to note this. So they would have observed uh, Yom Kippur in Fair Havens. And this would have been at about, this was October 5th um, in the year 59. So they were, they'd left before, um, before Rosh Hashanah, and they arrived in Fair Haven uh, and observed the Yom Kippur there, um, and then it was, and then the fast had passed, making it later still in the year. Verse ten, saying, uh, and Paul advised them, saying, "Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives." This isn't any divine revelation. This is just him knowing, like everybody knows, that November December is a terrible time of year to be going. We're getting closer to this. It could take up to two months. It's already the beginning of October. Um, of course, he wouldn't have used October, but he would have used Hebrew months. But anyway, beside the point. Um, please reconsider this. Like, I, like, no one else is saying speaking up. Like, I, I raise my hand. Like, sir. Like, let's let's reconsider this. Um, and also, what what is traditionally read on the Day of Atonement. There's a passage of scripture that we traditionally read. Say it. Jonah. Jonah. So he would have had this in mind as well <laughs> right before embarking on the sea journey. He, right? <laughs> Which this is when he, he spoke up and said, uh, let's not do this, right? Not when they left earlier in the trip, but now after some rough seas and they're spending some time reading Jonah, and they're probably looking at each other like, uh, <laughs> who, are you going to say something? I, I'll say so. Okay, I'll say something, right? So so that's on his mind as well. Um, verse 11, but the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. 
So the owner of the ship was on board. This is important. In these times, there was there was a, a an insurance policy, a Roman insurance policy that guaranteed ex, against loss of ships and cargo in stormy weather because of the importance of keeping the grain flowing from Alexandria. It was so important that grain keep coming to Rome from Alexandria. That was like, that was like it was worth its weight in gold. Then. They wanted to keep the flow going, so they insured against loss. All right. The owner of the ship is on the boat. If he was not on the boat, there may have been different decisions made, but he was on the boat, and he's saying, no, nope, we're going to go ahead okay, because of this insurance policy. They, they wouldn't have said that, but, but keep that in mind. that they A storm was not... At, at worst, he may have thought, well, we're going to have to just chuck some of the grain, right? But in a storm, I'll be uh, insured against that. That's fine. So let's just go ahead and go. All right, verse 12. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, the harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Now, when the south wind blew again, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. But soon, a tempestuous wind called the nor'easter struck down from the land and when the ship was caught and could not face the wind we gave way to it and were driven along all right so they had a false impression of this is not going to be bad like a nice a nice south wind blew gently like okay it's not gonna be bad paul oh, hush it's gonna be fine right it'll be fine but then after they said sail the wind was so bad that they had to drop sail and let the wind blow them wherever. If they kept the sail up, because these are wooden ships, and because of the amount of grain and weight in the in the hull of the boat, a strong wind trying to uh, attach to a mast that's trying to move this massively heavy body underneath would have what? Snapped. snapped. It would have snapped, right? So the, the only thing they could do was drop the sail and let the boat be pushed by the wind uh, in its form, right? Verse 16, running under the lee of a small island called Kauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that they would run aground in the Sirtis, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. Um, Grain does not do well when wet. What does what does grain do when it gets wet? It, well, it, it gets bigger. It swells and it gets heavier, right? And this because two hundred and seventy six passengers, like you know, extra people on a boat. How much grain do you think there was? Tons, tons of grain. And probably in bags and sacks, right? And so this was starting to, to look like a, a much bigger problem than they anticipated. So they had to actually wrap rope around the wood of the boat to keep it to keep it tight together. Because there was so much. If there was if there was water getting in at all, either through the waves crashing over and falling down into the open cavities or through uh, uh, cracks or something in the hull. Then, then instantly you have really you've got a real bad problem, right? So, so they had to reinforce it due to the load of grain. Um, verse eighteen: Since we were violently storm tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. Okay, so they they started to to go down, get some sacks of grain, all hands on deck. Everybody would have helped out, not just the crew. But soldiers, prisoners, passengers, they all would have been helping out. And this is lots of grain. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard. So they, they probably were doing this for at least a solid day, maybe two days straight, going down and going out and getting sacks. Not getting it rid of it all, but getting rid of enough that, that it wouldn't cause a problem. Maybe they were identified some wet sacks. Uh, and again, 19, and on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. So they were 
likely bailing water and also getting rid of any unessential gear, uh, anything, anything to lighten the load. Verse 20, when neither, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Okay, so it was so windy they had no sail. They couldn't do the sail. So they couldn't control where they were going. How important is it to see stars? Very. Very. Yeah. It's very important. So you can't nav they can't navigate. And, and not only that, they, they don't see where they're going. And the place that they were dreading the most, um, I think I have it down a little farther, <clears throat> was this uh, Certus. Uh, I, I think this is where, this is off the coast of Tunisia. So if you look at the Mediterranean, where they, where they and I'll do it, for you guys so that where they were coming from on the east over was was basically a straight shot but just south on the mediterranean there on the, the the north coast of of africa there is this little bit of a dip uh where benghazi is libya like this area and this in this dip is the is the um uh tunisian coast and there's lots of sandbars that go out really far into the sea so far that if you get stuck in these sandbars, you, you probably still can't see land and you are stranded and you will die. Like, like that is the worst part. They had no idea where they were going. They couldn't control where they were going, even if they did see. And they thought it's much more likely for them to have ended up in Tunisia, in, in this area, than for them to go straight across like they wanted to, to a small island off the coast of of Italy, like they ended up in Malta, right? It's like if you're if you're a betting man, you're not going to bet on you making it, right? You're going to say, okay, all all hope is lost, and it says here. During this time, Paul, who and they, they also had no food, they 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 were they were starving. What would Paul have done in in face of this? No food, no hope. What would he have spent his time doing? Praying and fasting, likely. It's like, well, I have no food anyway. Might as well make this purposeful. Okay, so he was likely praying and fasting. And during that time is when he would have received word from the Lord, a vision, so that, that, that would line up. Verse 21. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told, that we must run aground on some island. Okay. What part of that whole speech was entirely unnecessary? I told you so. Told you so. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> but Paul, being his disagreeable self, is just like, I told you so, and you're going to be okay. God, God's going to rescue us all. But I told you so. Like, okay. <laughs> Whatever. Oh, funny. Um, Thinking back again to Jonah, we know that uh, seafarers take omens from God very seriously, right? Even if it's not their God. Like, who who did this thing? Whose God did we just upset that makes this all happen, right? So, so the fact that he said this would have been instantly received by the seafarers. I'm like, okay, good. He didn't have to make a great case for it. He just had to say that his God... So that it would be okay, and it was it was it was an easy sell, and they were they were hopeless anyway. So it's like any any good news uh, was welcome. I told you so. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, verse twenty seven. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea. Okay, two weeks. Two weeks. Can you imagine? Neil and Marty just 
they're they're getting they're coming back from Europe and they did a cross a transatlantic cruise that took two weeks on a big boat and probably smooth and it was smooth sailing but even that I I I start to I, I drop into a flop sweat thinking about doing even that like uh, that that but two weeks tossed about on a on a wooden boat not knowing where you're going not a lot of food. At the end of this, they're probably going mad, right? Like, I, I can't, I can't imagine this. This, this is hard to think about. About midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land, so they took a sounding and found twenty fathoms. A little farther on, they took a sounding again and found fifteen fathoms. And just so you know, the average depth of the Mediterranean is eight hundred and sixteen fathoms. So the fact that they're getting to twenty and fifteen is signaling okay it's it's coming up significantly we're, we're we're about to come to land and what is it they don't want run into rocks they well they don't want to run into a sandbar or rocks or they, they don't want to get they think they're going to tunisia they think they're going down to this place where they will die right yeah. and fearing that we might run on the rocks they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come uh say hi to josh for us <laughs> uh, <funny. laughs> um, okay, fearing that they, we might run on the we have a lot of fun here. Just so you, yeah. uh, fearing they might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come, so that they could just see what was going. on. This is nighttime. Yeah. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow. So the, here were some sailors who were like, oh, yeah, we're just going to let the, the, the anchors out. But they were getting, they were going to go get in the boat themselves. Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. Okay. At this point, we see t Paul kind of taking charge, right? He's trusted by the, the Roman soldiers. Um, he, he's trusted by his companions and, and the prisoners. and the, he, he probably knows some of them. I don't know. So he's, he's kind of taking charge here and, and leading the way. Again, two weeks. They're all going crazy. right? It, it's just, I can't imagine the, 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 the setting, the environment that they're on. It's, it's horrible, right? So he takes charge. Verse 33, as day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. What does that mean, giving thanks to God? breaking bread. What is that? That's the the bracha. That's what we do. That's, that's the bracha. Then they all uh, were encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. Again, big boat. Not the biggest of the grain fleet, but still a very, very big boat. And when they had eaten enough, they, list, they lighted the ship throwing out the wheat into the sea. So this was the, the remaining grain that they had. Um, if, you're, if you're about to run aground, you want to be as high up in the water as possible uh, so that you uh, don't uh, have any damage or you're, 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 you're minimizing the surface area of the boat underwater. Uh, so where you run aground is going to be, you're, you'll be in a better position. And you will be farther in land so that if you have to jump out because the boat's gone right the, the rescue boat is, is gone so you you would want to be able to get out and maybe walk to safety <clears throat> verse 39 now when it was day they did not recognize the land but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned if possible to run the ship ashore okay beach equals rocks or no rocks no rocks, no rocks. Oh, hooray. Like, okay. Wonderful sight. It's good. Because even if you saw land and rocks, you could still die and perish. But you saw beach, okay. There's 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 a possibility we're all gonna make it. Um, 
So they cast off the anchors and le left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders, then hoisting the foresail to the wind so they, they could put the sail back up because there wasn't the danger of the mast snapping in half because of the weight of the ship. They'd gotten rid of everything now. Put the sail up, control where they're going for the first time because they can see a, a point in which they need to go. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. So they, maybe they didn't, they didn't get as far as they wanted to, and because of that, the waves were hitting the back of the boat, tearing it apart. Right. So it, this was like clock's ticking. Okay, we, we see where we need to go. we got to get off this ship ASAP. There was no landing craft, too, if you remember. Yeah. So verse 42, the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. Can you, uh, what's the penalty for a soldier who, whose uh, prisoner escapes? Any guesses? Death. death. Yeah, death penalty. Right. So, so they're thinking, okay, it's every man for himself. We have no boat to travel in. Every man for himself. We're all weak. It's been a long trip. Uh, as a soldier, I want to make absolutely sure I am going to live through this. If I, if I can't even, if I can't carry or keep track of the prisoner who's going into the water with me, and I'm only trying to care for myself, and we both make it, he makes it before I do and escapes, then I'm dead anyway. So it, it was a, this was self-preservation. It's better to kill the prisoners to ensure that, that I remain alive. That's, that was the motivation here. 43, but the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land. So he trusted Paul that all would survive. Verse 44, and the rest, of, and, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land and no one tried to escape. After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. Does anyone know what Malta means? Any idea? Place of refuge. So you can imagine they they like, where are we? Where are we? And someone says, place of refuge. And they would they have gotten a chuckle out of that? <laughs> They'd have been like, oh, thank God. Like, oh my goodness. Okay, good, right. And that it wasn't Africa, right? Because, again, they had no idea where they were. They still couldn't see the stars. So they weren't on the Tunisian coast. They weren't in Africa. They, didn't, they had much uh, less of a journey now uh, if, than if they had arrived in, in Africa. So they were quite relieved, very, very relieved. 28 verse 2, the native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had, been, it had begun to rain and was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, though he has escaped from the sea. Justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he must be a god. Okay. The, the only thing that I can say about this is that and there, there are probably other teachings and other sources that, that, that get into this in, in a better way than I can. But the only thing that, I've, that I could come up with this week was if if you are relying on if you're relying on the flesh your animal instinct extremes are easy right so what were the two options here for them he's either a murderer the worst kind of human being or he's a god like th there was no in between option here right so th th this is a people who don't know the God of, uh, of the universe. And when this sort of thing happens, the extremes are what the options are. This is, 
Does that make sense? Like it, it's we make generalizations based on um, on bad experiences, and and then we write off anything that could be a little more subtle than that. And that's all I got from this. Does that does that ring true? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. I was, I was thinking that maybe they were more so amazed because if they're locals, they know the snake. The, it must have been an indication that this is a well-known venomous species that has gotten onto his arm. So when they initially see it, they're probably like, wow, what horrible, awful luck to get out of that monstrosity only to die from a venomous snake bite around the campfire. Right. And then it just gets shaken off when it didn't do anything because God yeah. protected him. Yeah. They're like, that never happens. You've just escaped two impossibly de deadly situations. Mm -hmm. What other option is there? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's a good point. My yeah. version says it was the goddess justice. I don't know. Is that, is oh, um... Yeah. Uh, it was apparently a goddess. I don't know exactly. What's, what, which verse was that? Oh, um, verse 4 at the end. This says, the goddess Justice has not allowed him to live. So I agree. I like that. Right. Yeah. But I, also, if you can yeah. survive the attack of a goddess, allowing something, yeah. you must be a god, right? That would be the logical Right, and I think that that viper was the um, animal symbol of that this goddess of justice. I think, yeah. Um, right. The the other thing that I was thinking was that Paul is fearless here, right? I mean, he's he's just been through it all. He's maintained his faith even after having not eaten much for two whole weeks. I mean, it's like you're you're depleted. But you're still just fearless, or, or maybe it was that he was so delirious and out of it, it didn't matter. He could have, been, there could have been like a lion that hit him, and he just been, tried to just like shake it off, like maybe not even recognizing what it was. I don't know, but but his, I, I believe it's his his fearlessness, um, and and because of this, so I think I was I was wondering about this because this is a place that they're actually going to stay for the winter. They're going to stay there for a while, for three months. They're in this place, and there's only two things that that Luke writes about it. There's probably a lot of things that happened in those those three months. It's this episode, and then the next episode that happens sometime probably shortly after. I think that this happening here, this episode with the with the viper, is what allowed them to be invited to the chief's house. This is the the chief leader of the of of Malta. This impressed the people so much that that they brought him to the leader's home where they were washed and bathed and well fed and slept well and and treated very well all winter long right so this was this could have been you know if, if i'm if i'm trusting that god is 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 in everything this was like god making it so that they had some cush respite after a really really horrible trip like this is how it's going to happen maybe okay so verse seven moving on now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island, named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. So again, they were very well fed and, and, and uh, very well treated. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery, and Paul visited him and prayed, and putting his hands on him, healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly, and when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. Again, they were. This was a, this was three months of that, that made this this journey probably well worth it. Right. This is just. This was really nice. A, a nice gift. Verse eleven. After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria, with the twin gods as a figurehead. This, this is a boat probably that had been identified months earlier because this it's not a big place. And they would have said, okay, here's a boat. Hey, when are you leaving? Okay, we're making a reservation. We're going to go with you whenever you set sail. So that, that's probably how that came about. Verse 12, putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. And from there, we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. 
After one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to uh, Puteoli. Where they are in Regium is where the toe of the boot of Italy almost touches Sicily. Right there, those narrows, that's also a very treacherous place to go. There's rocks near the, the island of Sicily on the, on the west side, um, and and how the wind blows through there makes it treacherous. So they had to really time it well. So when this, when it says this south wind sprang up, they took advantage of it, set sail, so they could just blow, be blown right up through that, that narrows to get out of there. Verse 14. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. So if you see here, in many of these places... Uh, and then in, in the last verse, too, uh, so I'll just go ahead and read it. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Appius Market and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. Paul was allowed to stay with friends en route. Again, this is like a mobile house arrest. This is not a, you know, whip, whip them as every chance you get. This is just, okay, we've got to go do this thing that, you know, I'm sure at some point the centurion asked Paul about, you know, why are you... What's the story here? Why are you on this trip? Did you, so you didn't have to, but you wanted to. Like, okay, all right, man. Um, you can go stay with your friends, like, because you're probably gonna die or whatever. He's he's probably scratching his head as to why he would want to do this, even despite the fact that he could have been released. Um, it was a 130 mile journey over land once they got to where they were uh, going, uh, which was uh, near Naples, was where they would have landed. Um. And okay, so here's the question. How did the Romans receive his letter? If we see in 15, and the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Appius Market and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. So how did they take it? Pretty good. Yeah, it was a warm welcome. So warm, in fact, that people from Rome made a trip. You know, uh, uh, I can't remember. I think it's... Um, these two locations are roughly 40 miles and 10 miles from Rome. So most of this land journey there, the, the, he hasn't met anyone yet. Uh, but they're staying in inns uh, along the way. And when they get to the Appius Market, which is on the Appian Way, that's about 40 miles from Rome, several people came to greet him. And then when they got farther along, uh, where, we, where they think that the uh, three taverns was located roughly 10 miles from Rome. There were some more people who came to greet him before he arrived. This is good news, because I can imagine Paul this whole time is, had, had been wondering, I wonder how this is going to go. I wonder how, what kind of thing I'm going to be walking into in this community in Rome based on what I know they experienced, the letter I wrote that encouraged them to be one. How is this going to play out? Um, so yeah, so so this then leads into um, the uh, um, the next rest of the chapter, and then yeah. So that's all I got for today. What, um, any any thoughts about this, about their trip, about um, anything that that maybe stuck out to you that we could share? ship was so gung-ho to go right that minute i mean sure there's an insurance policy on his <clears> stuff but he was on his boat if his boat sinks so does he i think he thought he it wouldn't sink he may it, 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 i mean i can't i can't speak for him but i imagine he had a bit of arrogance about himself um that said oh we'll be fine um yeah any any other thoughts on that i think yeah i think i agree with that i mean like uh, why are you telling me or aren't you some theologian or you know what do you know about the sea basically right you know like, right. i'm kind of just i know what i'm doing <laughs> you know, yeah and they didn't he sense. hadn't established paul hadn't established himself as someone trustworthy for the owner of the ship and the pilot the other folks would have known, and maybe the centurion was like, yeah, why don't you go tell them uh, about this, too? Because he may have been concerned as well. 
Um, but at that point, they didn't. Eventually, we see that you know Paul took kind of took charge, and we don't hear anything else about what the pilot and the owner of the boat said. So there, there was a bit of a um, trust build up during this during this journey. Um, I think, see if you have anything else you want to add. I'm, I'm looking at some of the questions I sent out for our, on our discussion guide. Um, what do you think is the reason why Luke chose those two incidents of the Viper and the healing of the father on the, uh, the island's magistrate? If, if not, if, if in addition to what I was saying, how the Viper incident is what, what inspired these Maltese people to invite him and be, and, and be taken care of, why else would, why else do you think Paul or Luke would have included these two stories in this journey? Okay. Yeah. He does that. Yeah. I don't know how it would fit, but to the two circumstances remind me of in the wilderness with the uh, bronze serpent and then people getting healed. <clears throat> I'm thinking, well, how does that fit? Because mm -hmm. it was kind of like identified that if you got bit in the wilderness, was attached to sin, right? Mm, I think so. Yeah. And if you, yeah. And if you, that was how you were cleansed. What yeah. Moses had said, you know, with the bronze serpent, you'd be healed. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, not an answer, but <laughs> well, no, I yeah, <laughs> that's that, an association, right? Exactly. Kind of makes me think, like so many things in the scriptures, uh, you know, when there's a associations like that there's a connection but and lo and luke knows who he's, who he's writing to as well these are people who would be very familiar with uh, with that yeah. with those stories too yeah it could be that this is just more uh, affirming paul's mission and his who he who it is that sent him to do this thing. Like this is of God, absolutely. That this is happening. Yeah. And with no three in the position, there's more in two to safety of the body. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Again, this was a this was a, a one of, another interesting uh, portion that is uh, not filled with at least obvious spiritual lessons. There's a lot we can learn. Um, I I love getting into the context of things and the history of it and just the details and um, and you know seeing his seeing Paul's humor a bit and. <laughs> Is that he just had to say I told you so, but I I would probably have done the same thing. Um, th this this helps to make all of this so much more real to me, which is so important. Um, you know, understanding understanding how a, a, a sailing vessel works and, and seeing how they responded to it and how it makes perfect sense. Uh, the the dangers that they were facing on this trip. Um, were so much more than than just the 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 wind and the waves that we were uh, that we read about. It was the possibility of ending up in a certain place that would have just uh, spelled absolute uh, catastrophe for them, um, and that they were human people dealing with fear, a lot of fear, a lot of fear, um, uh, and that uh, like Paul, we should be as as fearless as we can. And I'm sure he became more fearless after he had been told, you must stand before Caesar. So, okay, now I know I'm going to make it, and everyone's going to make it too, because if, if God said, I, I must stand before Caesar, guess what? I'm going to stand before Caesar. So whatever happens, snake, waves, 
wind, whatever, hunger, go through it. Just got to go through it. And uh, maybe that's why he also kind of rose to, to be looked at as a leader at one point when things were just really, really bad. So, All right. Well, thanks, guys. Um, let's go ahead and pray, and then uh, we'll uh, uh, go ahead and have some food. So, Father, we thank you. We praise you for your perfect word. Um, we thank you again for, for Paul, for Luke for their companions on this trip. We thank you for Paul's uh, steadfastness, his fearlessness, um, and we, we praise you in how you used this, this man, this disagreeable um, curmudgeon of a, of a guy who you know probably rubbed people the wrong way sometimes, but you had a specific use for him and in, in, in the kind of instrument he was and that he was a ready instrument for you. Is, is so encouraging and, and that we can look at ourselves and say, okay, what kind of, what kind of person am I? What kind of personality am I? Um, and, and trust that God can use us uh, in whatever situation we're faced with and that uh, you're with us just like you were with him and his companions and all the people on the boat. So we thank you. Thank you for your Shabbat. Uh, thank you for this group of folks here at Mike's house and and uh, we just thank you for all your many blessings and ask us to ask you to bless us as we continue our rest today. And we pray all this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen.